Marshall here. Welcome back to the YouTube version of the Realignment Podcast. I've got a great conversation today with Bloomberg News' Slay Emotion about her new book, Paper Soldiers, How the Weaponization of the Dollar Changed the World Order. Basically, to understand going into this conversation, as Saleh documents, ever since the 1990s, there was a strong bipartisan consensus in Washington that a strong dollar was to the benefit of America's domestic and foreign policy. However, ever since the election of Donald Trump and events worldwide from the crisis in Ukraine to debates about how the U.S. sanctioned regime steps up as a deterrent to conflict, we've seen an increasing of debate about the degree to which the strong dollar is a cost rather than purely a benefit. So Saleh in this conversation is going to take us into those debates and why no matter what happens in the 2024 election, this space is no longer the consensus it used to be going back to the 1990s. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. Saleh Moshin, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me, Marshall. Yeah, I'm really excited to speak to you, not only as an author, but as a fellow podcaster. I'd like to start with uh, your background and your beat real quick. Obviously, you're covering Washington uh, from the perspective of Bloomberg News, but that's the biggest possible beat ever. So let's kind of narrow it down a bit and explain how that leads into the book we're talking about today. Yeah, I would say right now I cover money, politics, and power and how that shapes Washington and the rest of the world. Washington is obviously quite powerful. So how some of the decisions that are made in Washington affect domestically our country and then internationally, but always with an economic lens on everything. Um, and then what led me to the book, actually, I was uh, a treasure reporter for Bloomberg at Washington for six years uh, and so it's a Treasury Department book. It's all about the dollar. And so that's what led me to it. Why does it feel like the quote unquote dollar and issues and debates around American currency policy? It feels like these policy areas have been incredibly understudied and undercovered, not from a reporter's perspective, but just from a discourse perspective. Because you kind of start the book off in the 1990s with then Secretary uh, Robert Rubin, and he's talking about the dollar and a strong dollar policy. And I think a lot of folks listening to the show will think about, okay, debates around immigration in the 90s, debates about American manufacturing in the 1990s, but they probably won't think about that through the lens of the dollar. I'd love you to kind of start off by talking around that dynamic. Yeah, and that's kind of gets to the genesis of the book idea. Um, you know, for a journalist, it's a, it's a natural course to think about writing a book at some point. And there's so many books about the Federal Reserve, book after book after book, and they're all great. And they all um, serve their own special role in our history and the telling of our history. Uh, and, but they don't touch on the dollar. And then if you look at Treasury, there's a musical called Hamilton. There are a lot of um, uh, Treasury Secretary autobiographies. Uh, that are terrific and they are all encompassing. But, you know, having covered uh, government U.S. currency or government currency policy, you know, I started in Norway, tiny little um, country compared to the U.S. But when I was there, one of my first jobs was to ask the prime minister and the finance minister what they thought of their kroner and like its impact. It was a commodities driven uh, economy. They had the world's largest servant wealth fund. So there was an impact that I get to the U.S., and I learned that the strong dollar policy and asking a treasury secretary is something that you do. And they it's a you play chicken. They don't want to talk about it. You want to ask them questions. Traders, investors are interested. It had been this light theme um, for decades. And it was Donald Trump who kind of brought it to the fore that the dollar affects trade. And let's talk about it. You know, sec treasury finance ministers economic officials are afraid to talk about anything that's going to move markets. If they talk about the dollar, if they opine, it will move markets. So it felt like there wasn't a lot of grist there, you know, um, because no one wanted to talk about it. And then he did. He wanted to discuss it. And then I just started thinking, there is so much here. Our entire, like, if you think about uh, how we have power, it's the economy, stupid. Like, that's how we have power in the world. That's how we're able to export our foreign policy objectives because we are the world's largest economy. And then I just kind of took that line down to where is it specifically? And I thought King Dollar has a lot to do with it. Something I'm really curious about, could you explain what it means? I was trying to find the best way to introduce this topic to folks. What does it mean for the U.S. to have a strong dollar dollar? 
if we're defining that like as a policy objective, this feels like a category where maybe the terms aren't helpful because why would we want to have a weak dollar? We should just have a strong dollar by definition. Explain what having a strong dollar means and what the actual Overton window of what the debate actually would be. Because I think it's hard to imagine a politician in private saying, yeah, look, I'm going to really desire a weak dollar in comparison to a strong dollar. So there's two components to it. We'll brush one aside very quickly. It's the exchange rate, the actual value of the dollar against another currency. That is one thing. How how many pounds, British pounds or Japanese yen can my dollar buy if I go overseas or if I'm importing goods? That is one side of the uh, argument. And the US, um, especially in the 90s and up until Trump, uh, wanted a strong value for the dollar because we wanted to import a lot of goods from overseas. That was sort of the, the uh, underpinnings of globalization. Let's keep trade open. We have a huge consumer-driven economy. The world wants to benefit from it. If the world economy is strong and interdependent, we'll have a stable uh, geopolitical environment. So that that's one benefit. The separate benefit or the separate definition of a strong dollar is a dominant dollar, a dollar that reigns supreme. It's the world's most important asset. Uh, the world literally runs on dollars. You can't, the whole global financial system, it's a dollar sign around everything. So if you want to buy oil, if countries want to trade oil, if um, a fisherman in Papua New Guinea wants to sell his fish, he is probably at some point going to touch the global financial system if it's a look, anything above like a micro sale. That means you are touching the dollar. And so that strength that everyone needs it is another kind of strength and it's more about dominance. And why does a strong dollar lead to more imports versus a weak dollar? So that comes down to just terms of trade. Uh, if a dollar exchange rate, if the value of the dollar is high, that means anything that China is selling, I can buy more of because the Chinese yuan uh, is weaker in comparison to a strong dollar. Let's say it's $5. You can also think about it. I think my favorite comparison is a Big Mac. How much? How many Big Macs can you buy with $20, right? If the currency exchange rate is strong, it's high, then you go to, let's say, uh, Europe, and it's like five euros a burger. So that got you four, four burgers. If the exchange rate is weak, then your dollar is by fewer euros. So maybe it's three burgers or it's two burgers because the euro by uh, you know supply and demand exchange rates are higher. And the key thing when you're telling this story, you focus on 1995, this uh, Robert Rubin speech. What was the U.S. bipartisan, say, approach to the dollar before the 1990s and the end of the Cold War? Oh, it was so exciting, actually. I think I would have loved to have been a Treasury reporter in the 80s. Uh, my my contacts at Treasury kind of joke that, oh, Soleil, you just want to cover the Plaza or the Louvre Accord. Basically, in the 80s and, and a little bit before that, too, there was an era of so much currency intervention by governments, including the U.S. Treasury Department. And what I mean by that is there's a exchange rate, there's a value of the dollar, and the U.S. government doesn't like it. And so they go in and they either buy a bunch of dollars to artificially um, uh reduce the supply and then the, the value goes up, or if they want it to be weaker for whatever reason, they will sell a bunch of, of dollars and increase supply so the, the value goes down. And it was this kabuki game where no one really would fully admit it that it was about to happen until the Treasury Department put out a statement and they worked quietly behind the scenes with the Federal Reserve uh, the Federal Reserve would do daily checks with traders. And sometimes, because then traders knew that the government could intervene, it's not a completely free and open and fair market. Big Brother is going to come in and change it. They start like this tea leaf reading routine of like trying to figure out, are they about to? And so then reporters start asking questions to see like, 
Does the Treasury Secretary or the chair of the Federal Reserve like the value that it's at now? What words is he or she going to say that might hint at what they might do next? And Treasury and Fed officials knew this. So they would make calls into to market participants and say things, leading questions about the dollar or leading statements about the dollar to just control it through like uh, verbal interventions like that. And so it took Rubin coming in and they, I think gov- the government kind of realized this isn't a great situation, that there's so much currency volatility and people are just parsing our each utterance about the economy or the dollar and it's causing problems. So he sought to bring calm to that whole regime. And it's interesting. I'm glad you used the word uh, kabuki because this process literally involved the Japanese. Um, talk about um, in the 1980s, the fact that you had all the parsing and the statements you were describing, but you actually had like meetings like at the Plaza Hotel, very, very 1980s coded. Um, talk about that private process by which these countries um, leading currencies would kind of negotiate and find some type of the US led consensus. Yeah, I talk about this in a chapter called The Birth of the Hegemon, which is the birth of the dollar as this dominant uh, asset. There in 1985 or 86, there was a a meeting at the Plaza Hotel in Manhattan where finance ministers at the time, it was about the G5 and it included West Germany, the US, Great Britain, Japan, and I think France. And they realized that the They weren't happy with the strength of the dollar in that moment. And they couldn't figure out how are we going to manage this? And they realized that it's it's bad for for everyone. You know, the dollar is really, really strong compared to other current currencies. It's bad for other countries. Let's get together and figure this out. And it was uh, Treasury Secretary Baker, Jim Baker at the time. Mm -hmm. And he. The whole cabinet didn't even know, Reagan's entire cabinet didn't even know that this meeting was going to happen. Obviously, the president would know. They snuck finance ministers in through back doors so that the press didn't get whiff of it. They all sat down and agreed that they would all work to uh, temper the dollar's strength. They took their action, and eventually there was a statement but it was a big deal that these big nations are coming together to control the dollar. Um, so that they allow that to happen. The dollar weakens and then they realize, oh, we did a little bit like too good of a job. So they meet again, this time in France at somewhere near the Louvre. Uh, and it's called the Louvre Accord uh, a couple of years later to kind of pair that back. And so you can see how by the time Ruben comes in, in the early and mid nineties, c- currency traders are just waiting constantly for the next time that there's a secret meeting somewhere. Mm. So I guess what I'm trying to understand then is during this period of volatility during the 1980s and you have all this parsing of statements and the reporters and all these different accords in different locations, just tell the, tell the story yeah. of that volatility from the perspective of let's say like a Rust Belt American or yeah. someone who just is, 30 years later, seeing themselves in a very Trumpian light? Yeah, that's a great question. And I love tracing through history how we got to the populism that we have today. It's a really important exercise that we should be doing uh, historically and intellectually and politically. Um, That kind of volatility, basically unpredictability in markets, in the business environment, particularly the American business environment, because we are the largest, we're the biggest superpower. The dollar is the world's reserve asset. It was in the 80s. It means that farmers, manufacturers, exporters, domestically in the US and externally, they can't make long term plans, their business plans, because the manufacturing sector relies heavily on the terms of trade, the exchange rate. So you can, you know, everyone has researchers and analysts and economists who help them predict what it might be. And then you can base your plans, your five or 10 year plan or two or five year plan around that prediction. But if the government is coming in and artificially changing it based on a metric that you don't actually have, they have it, but they don't tell you what their preferred value is and what necessarily triggers the U.S. Treasury Department to step into dollar markets or call 
a meeting of the five families to to step in, then it's a little unfair. So you can't make those plans. Um, that that's probably the the core uh, way that it affects Amer- affected Americans in the Rust Belt or in, in Middle America. So I guess the real question here, and you kind of said this earlier, but I want to make this very clear: is we should understand the 1990s consensus around the Rubin approach, because obviously that consensus has continued into the George W. Bush administration. The belief then at the time is we have reduced the volatility. Globalization's happened. Globalization benefits the U.S., peace, trade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How does that consensus – actually, let me actually put it this way. How would you assess the accuracy of policymakers' assessments of the world from 1995 onwards? Because I think the key thing that kind of happened now with all these debates over deglobalization and populism is people start to say, okay – we were a little too sanguine about the effects of the rise on right. We 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 treated China's rise as, as inevitable in ways that like cut off policy debates. AKA, there actually could have been a more serious debate about admitting China to the WTO in 2000 versus what actually ended up happening. So, how would you assess the difference between like the ideology of Robert Rubin and Co. and the actual way policy went leading up into Trump? So, in the beginning. The intentions were good. It was to bring calm and diffuse the volatility around currency markets and the current and the U.S.'s currency policy. Bob Rubin came up with the mantra: "The strong a strong dollar is in the nation's interest," and just repeated it, repeated it because he thought this is how I'll make it boring. I'm just going to say the same old thing over and over again, and then they had to slowly curb the number of interventions. Uh, and he accomplished that. After a couple of years, yeah, you'd have reporters asking about it, particularly when uh, there was a switch between Dem- a Democratic and a Republican administration. And you had Paul O'Neill. Um, he came from industry. He worked in the um, aluminum sector. And so you'd think manufacturing uh, folks probably want a weaker dollar. Is the strong dollar policy over? He adopted it. So it became bipartisan. So he kept it stable. It wasn't like administration to administration, the dollar policy was changing. So it did bring this level of calm, brought the temperature down to something that's uh, underpinning, you know, it's, it's the, you know, finally reaching some sort of stability. Mm-hmm. At the same time, you have globalization really taking root. Uh, NAFTA, you have uh, China joining the WTO in the early 2000s, and the rest of the world kind of rallying around this. And Part of that has to do with calm currency markets and less manipulation or or interventions in currency markets. And so the U.S. needed to tell China and other Asian nations, no more meddling in your currencies. We've stopped. Now you need to stop. And for China, it was a very large shift because they were going from a command economy, sort of all dictated by the, the government, uh, to slowly an open market economy. And so it's still, you know, not settled. And um, it took, it's been taking them time, but the U.S. had to kind of set that example. The intentions were good, right? It's a consumer driven economy. If we can buy more goods from overseas, the American consumer um, has more purchasing power. They can buy mm-hmm. more stuff. Um, they have more variety. It also means, you know, the ultimate plan uh, after World, World War II at Bretton Woods, this big conference that I write about in the book briefly, where the dollar was crowned king dollar as the world's reserve asset, it was all, and the IMF was created, the World Bank was created, it was all to knit the world uh, together deeply economically so that we can't go as easily to war with each other. Um, and it worked, right? If we're economically integrated, open trade, lots of trade, then we're not going to constantly be trying to shoot each other, right? So that did work. What happened was um, you saw the manufacturing sector wasn't always called the Rust Belt. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. It was it was the boom, boom times, you know, in the 80s and early 90s uh, for the manufacturing sector. You saw those uh, factories close you know, America is known for company towns. You know, in, in the book, I take you to Weirton, West Virginia, where there's a glass maker. I take you to uh, Moraine, or sorry, a, a tin maker. 
aluminum, or sorry, and I take you to Moraine, Ohio, where there's a glass maker and a plant that has evolved from different products and is the heart of the town. Everyone works there or knows somebody who works there. The restaurants and schools serve the people who work there. And that's how you became a, 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 a city. When the manufacturing sector leaves because it is too expensive to uh, pay workers in America, it is because you have to charge people more for your goods you because you can't export them overseas if the dollar is so strong you can't gather up people the japanese companies can't gather up enough yen to buy that car mm -hmm. so everyone's thinking let me buy the japanese car because it's just so much cheaper my dollar is so much stronger and then china and japan they don't want american cars they're twice the price so those those that's a manufacturing sector in the heartland started to shrivel up and in the midst of that you've got you know, and people talked about it at Paul O'Neill's hearing in 2000, January of 2000, you had both Republicans and Democrats talking about the problems of steel workers and steel manufacturers. Um, but it was kind of overlooked because globalization brought so much, so many benefits with it. They thought, oh, well, we just need programs to retrain people and then they'll find different jobs. And no one really thought through that you can't really retrain someone in the middle of their life into some new job like that. There's a, a, a whole generation of economic scarring that's going to come with come with this. And those people are kind of ignored then. Right. And then in the middle of it, you've got 9-11. Mm -hmm. Then you have the global financial crisis. So they kept being put on the back burner. And it kind of came to the fore. And what for me really crystallized it is in 2000 and 2016, on election night or like the, the middle of the night, I wrote a story and the headline, I've got it in front of me because I, I come back to the story often. It's Trump magnifies glass half empty economy to, ca uh, to sway cast off workers. Trump magnifies glass half empty economy to sway cast off workers. It was the forgotten man. Mm -hmm. They finally, their voice was finally heard. That everyone's talking about the global financial crisis. There's we got this great recovery, Obama and Clinton and 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 Jeb Bush and everyone saying there was a recovery. It wasn't as good as it could have been. If you're a Republican Democrat saying, oh, we fixed it all. No one was talking about the Rust Belt except for Donald Trump. He took his. Uh, he he held rallies in cities that had never seen a presidential candidate come through. And he licked his finger, stuck his finger in the wind and decided his policies. If he talked about China and globalization and people cheered, OK, I'm going to work on that rather than these focus groups to figure out what policies do people want. He just listened. And that's how we get to the overlooked part. And that's populism. Now we're seeing the the result of it. Yeah, it's interesting because the only modification I'd offer on that story as someone to cover this space is Jeb Bush and Mitt Romney would very concernedly critique like the economic recovery after the 2000 financial crisis. They would just say very the answer point. was tax cuts. They would say the answer. They 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 would they would basically um, suggest a specific like free market oriented approach that even if it did increase economic growth in specific ways, wouldn't necessarily address the manufacturing issues you're describing. That that's you know, such a good point. You know, free market. We're gonna get to you know Jeb Bush put out this book. You know, it's about getting to four percent economic growth. That's great, and I think a bunch of different very specific ways. But that would not inherently address some of those like midwestern Cincinnati. Michigan concerns you were talking about there. So that's a really good way of articulating how even within the like disagreement between the two parties, there was this third space that Trump is obviously, obviously covering. So one last question before we get into the second part of the story. And actually, this is part of the title of the book about the weaponization of the dollar. This is the foreign policy aspect. But I think, I mean, this is just so important because once again, this is undercover. It's so people have to understand all this. I'm fascinated by debates around alternate histories around U.S. manufacturing, like in the sense that if we're looking at all these different things that caused uh, manufacturing to flee the U.S., we could talk about, okay, cost of labor. We could talk about automation. We could talk about the strength of the dollar. We could talk about labor unions, all, all these different policies. I guess what I'm really asking you is if 
let's say Ross Perot is president. And in 1995, let's not like guess what Ross Perot's approach to the dollar would have been because that's a little too complicated. Let's just say for a second you had a presidency that was oriented around using a, a, a weaker dollar to prop up U.S. manufacturing and exports. How much do you think that would have limited the flight of manufacturing jobs from this country? Because when you tell this story of alternate choices, I just kind of go back to this idea of like, look, there were probably all sorts of things in the 1880s in Great Britain that were that could have been done to basically prevent the U.S. from taking manufacturing jobs. But at the end of the day, you were going to transition from Manchester um, to Michigan. That was probably going to be inevitable to some degree. So I'm just curious, how much do you think this dollar story plays in this broader, complicated picture of the reasons that jobs flood the country? We just point to 2016 and 17 again, the massive rupture that was caused when Trump came on the scene and said these things. No one thought he was going to win. I was overseas from 2008 to 2016 in Northern Europe, and I came to D.C. Everyone said there's no way Trump's going to win. Republicans were saying he's just like he's not going to become the the GOP candidate that he becomes. There's no way he's going to win. No one expected that anything he was saying made sense to anyone. And it did. It really did. And so and at the time, everyone, mainstream economists, establishment and politicians were broadly OK with globalization. No one was singing a different tune. It was just Donald Trump. So for that to have happened in the 90s or the early noughties would have been just as big of a rupture, maybe bigger, because, again, in 2001 and 2008, we had two major crises that took our eye off of this ball. We had 9-11 and then the global financial crisis. So I think whenever it was going to happen, it was going to be painful. Hey, it's Marshall. In an exponential era, it's more important than ever for our country to have alignment between policymakers, founders, and funders. However, it's rare that we find all of them in the same room. Luckily, the A16Z podcast from Andreessen Horowitz just dropped a brand new series on American dynamism focused on exactly this. Coined by Realignment Friend and A16Z general partner Catherine Boyle, American dynamism is a movement that embodies the spirit of innovation. And this new four-part series, recorded in the heart of Washington, D.C., covers topics including intelligence in the era of AI, the nuclear renaissance, and the future of defense. Guests include the CIA's first ever chief technology officer, Nand Multandani, the Department of Energy's assistant secretary for nuclear energy, Dr. Catherine Huff, and director of the DOD's defense innovation unit, Doug Beck. Not to mention the founders of ambitious companies rivaling the status quo, like microreactor company Radiant, AI pilot company Shield AI, and advanced autonomous systems company Anderol. So don't miss out. Go check out the A16Z podcast and their new series on American Dynamism on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. So to take this story beyond 2016 and early 2017, what actually happens then when President Trump is now president and then you have Treasury Secretary um, Steven Mnuchin, you talk about, you begin the book by talking about like an incident that happens at Davos. Let's actually focus on Trump's uh, maybe only, maybe first term. What actually happens when you, you transition from the campaign trail to the actual policy implementation phase? Well, first, it was shocked that all of the things that he's this politician, this Donald Trump at that point as a politician said he was going to do, he actually started to do it or really try to do it. Right. That doesn't necessarily always happen. There's lots of fancy talk on the campaign trail and then people come into office and they kind of button down. He actually did it. Everyone loves to talk ch tough, tough on China on the campaign trail. China knows this. The president comes to the office. He tempers that down. China also knows that's going to happen. Didn't happen this time. He started, uh, he late designated China a currency manipulator. He did the, the trade tariffs. He ended this big economic dialogue that the U.S. and China relied on. He stopped all of it because this isn't working for us. Um, he also, you know, he talked about wanting to weak, weaken the dollar and then he got into office and he talked about it behind, sitting behind the resolute desk with his treasury secretary and his trade advisor and his national economic council director and said, let's do this. Um, and that's one of the moments that I covered deeply as a treasury reporter in that time. And then I wrote about in the book that Donald Trump talked to his advisors, Peter Navarro, Larry Kudlow and, treasury, and uh, secretary Stephen Mnuchin saying, I want to do this now, look into it. 
And Steve and Mnuchin realize that this is not the 80s or the 90s. The currency market is a lot larger. So the 70 or 90 billion dollars that the U the Treasury Department has on hand in something called the Exchange Rate Stabilization Fund, which is just to stabilize currency markets, is just going to cause a mere blip. And also quick, quick pause to make this clear yes. for folks. Because when we were talking about like the Plaza Accords, when the US is manipulating the system buying its currency, it's using that 70 to 90 billion, correct? And so the point you're making is the economy is just so much bigger now that you couldn't do you you just couldn't do a second version of the Plaza Accord. Is is, is that is that a correct interpretation? So um the money in that fund, ESF, it fluctuates. Um and it's not the economy, it's that the currency um, markets are so huge now okay. that the U.S. itself couldn't go in and do something unless you had allies. And as Kudlow told Trump in that moment, who's going to do this with us? No one likes us right now. We've triggered trade wars everywhere. Um, so the U.S. didn't have allies in that moment. And you always needed the Federal Reserve to join in. And in that moment, uh, even though Trump appointed and nominated Jay Powell, he had picked a big bone with him, called him a bonehead publicly, you know? And so the Fed, not just for those reasons, but for deeper reasons of um, intervention, probably not working and it meddling in a way that would be damaging, wasn't going to get on board. So what's super interesting there to your comment about allies, obviously what makes the 80s policy work is to a certain degree you have, as you said it, Japan, France, West Germany, aligned with the U.S. policy in that category. What did these other economies think about the strength of the dollar circa 2017, 2018? Obviously, you have the euro. You don't just have like, you know, the franc or the Deutschmark. Um, what was the foreign perception of the strong dollar policy during the Trump administration? Yeah, it, by then it had been in place for almost a quarter of a century. So it was just part of like the economic assumptions that had been there for so long. Let's just keep it because it's stable and it means nothing's going to change. And, you know, foreign countries were benefiting from it, you know, to have uh, better terms of trade and be able to export to the U.S. this massive consumer driven economy that's good for them. Um, so, you know, they had no complaints uh, until there's a rupture. If the U.S., the leader of the world, is going to cause a rupture like that, especially if it's going to be have economic blows, then it's a concern for everyone. Okay, so let's get to the second part of the book, weaponization. Um, what does it mean to weaponize the U.S. dollar? Yeah, so that's the third component, right? Like we talked about the exchange rate side of the dollar. We talked about its strength and dominance. And then we get to... Uh, the safety and protection and then weaponization that it offers um, because it is the world's, you know, it's a national treasure, the world's reserve asset. Um, that strength means that if uh, the U S thinks that a country is misbehaving, there's lots of ways to put it, terrorism or nuclear prol proliferation or whatever, uh, disrupting the world order, then the U.S. has a right to say, well, you can't use the dollar anymore, which means you can't use the global financial system. Now, there's a spectrum of that um, action. Sanctions are incredible economic sanctions. That's what it means to cut someone off from the dollar. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You can have carve out so it's not as painful. It's kind of like a vice where you're slowly mm -hmm. tightening it, tightening it on someone to get them to change their behavior. But with nine, and that the U.S. had done in various forms of embargoes and such previously. Um, but 2001, you know, 9-11 hits. And the first act in the global war on terror that George W. Bush started was not a machine gun. It was no tanks rolling anywhere or American, like military boots on the ground. It was... Through the U.S. Treasury Department, it was with the dollar. It was saying, we're cutting off the uh, certain terrorist groups from using the dollar point blank, and we are using the power of the dollar to track money flows, figure out how terrorists financed the attack so that we can first stop any other attack from happening and find out who all was involved and cut them off. 
So it was the dollar. It was a stroke of a pen, September 24th, 2001. After that, it was that then the blood you know, started spilling. So then the other immediate uh, perception of like the weaponization, the dollar is obviously going to be like the sanction. The, I think the big ones, early 21st century, the, the sanctions policy towards Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine. Tell that mm-hmm. side of the story. Yeah. So, you know, we, we've had... 20 plus years of ramping up economic sanctions um, in the wake of 9-11 and the Patriot Act, a whole unit was created inside of Treasury. There's the domestic policy unit, international policy unit, and then they added in 2004 uh, terrorism and financial intelligence. And that is basically financial intelligence and sanctions sat inside of that. And so um, little, pro- you know, big problems are coming along, Iran, um, Lebanon, et cetera, you know, Russia and the annexation of Crimea. And they're using this leverage, the economic sanctions to uh, bully and to export foreign policy and to bully adversaries. Um, say the use of sanctions had has grown um, 933% between 2001 and I don't know, 2021 or 2022. By February 2022, it's a potent weapon. People are scared of it. Just the mere threat of sanctions has an impact by now. Um, Russia uh, triggered what is arguably the greatest military crisis since World War II, uh, a land invasion in Europe. And, you know, Russia is a G20 country. Um, it is the world's 11th largest economy. It is so deeply integrated in the world economy through commodities, you know, aluminum and metals and oil exports. Everyone needs that oil. Everyone needs that those metals. And Putin thought, you know, he had started to diverse away, diversify away from the dollar somewhat in preparation, it seems. He had a half trillion dollar war chest and it was some in dollars and some in other currencies. Um, he had really deepened trade with Germany and Europe because of proximity. And he figured, well, the U.S. might sanction us. It won't be so damaging. Europe won't because it would be too damaging to Europe. And then maybe even U- the U.S. wouldn't get involved because like the plan was from Bretton Woods, we're going to be so interconnected that if I try to hurt you, you end up hurting yourself. Right. No one thought the U.S. would take would lead in such a big action. It was considered the nuclear option in the Mm -hmm. Biden White House. Um, The U.S. said, we're going to do it. Um, They knew they had to do it very quickly. Uh, They did it on a Saturday. They got together. Uh, The package had been prepared. The G7 had signed on and it took some persuading because everyone knew there will be a self-inflicted wound from pushing Russia away from the dollar or to begin to. It's not ultimately completely cut off. Um, And at five something PM on Saturday, February 26th, the U.S. announced that we are sanctioning, cutting off the Russian central bank from the dollar. And uh, uh, we don't have to go into it too deeply, but also cutting them off from SWIFT, which is like a communication system among banks. And the U.S. led that and, and, you know, almost half the world joined. And on that day, you know, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, I go pretty deeply into it in the book. Um, she has a moment of hesitation because she realizes I am the current steward of the dollar. And are we going too far with it? Um, the U.S. takes the action. She signs on. She realizes this might be the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. Uh, when you are rupturing the world through this great military crisis, maybe this is the moment that you do this. And ever since then, there has just been talk that, well, the U.S. has political volatility. And what if Trump comes back and that um, unpredictability still exists in the U.S.? They're so deeply divided right now. And now you're using the dollar to bully us. Um, Maybe it's not worth being so dependent on the dollar. Now, that talk has happened constantly. Mm -hmm. Right. Since for since 1944, when, you know, the dollar became the world's reserve asset, everyone's wondering when is the demise of this this reign. Um, But this is the first time that it's happening with such urgency. There is some action behind it. 
and uh, we can unpack, you know, where we think it might go from here. I guess the question would be, when the sanctions were first launched, once again, it's, it's the nuclear option. There was this prediction and perception that this would be crippling um, from Russia's perspective. Obviously, there have been incredibly high costs to the sanctions policy, but Russia has been able to weather it to the degree which they have just continued the, the the invasion. And what ended up actually mattering um, was the actual battlefield outcome relative to it. Um, Russia just had the ability to weaponize their literal economy and transition to a wartime economy. And maybe you're not perfectly economically efficient, but you're still able to get the job done there. Um, has that result impacted the long-term ability of sanctions to deter conflict behavior aggression does china look at that situation and say hey everyone knows that there's an invasion of taiwan separate from u.s military intervention there will almost certainly be a severe u.s sanctions policy seeing russia weathering and russia isn't exactly the greatest economy in the world does that suggest there's a world where sanctions have lost a lot of their bite um, from a dictating behavior perspective. I will say, Marshall, this debate is raging right now in Washington. Um, I've done a fair bit of reporting on it. Sanctions are incredibly complicated to explain. Like you have to know what was the goal. And actually sanctions aren't a policy. It's a tool. Mm. Um, you know, so when you're building a house, you have a strategy of how to build the house, a map, you've got the sanctions are like the hammer of putting it all together. So if your house falls down, you don't necessarily blame the hammer for failing the way people say sanctions have failed. You might be blame the strategy behind it. And sanctions is a large component of it or the potency of the hammer of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, and they're also hard to measure because you're talking in counterfactuals. You have to try to guess like what would have happened if we had not done it? Mm -hmm. But you can't really measure that. So then you're looking at what's in front of you and it, the immediate impact, the, the ruble plunged 30 percent and the, the central bank had to go through a lot to, to prop it up and to keep things going. There's some facts that are out there. One, that Russia has lost its prestige and standing in the, in the, in the world. Uh, maybe they didn't care about it. So who knows if that really hurts them. They have had a lot of money leave. They are a war economy now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and they have not, you know, I think it. there was a feeling if you go back and, and I mentioned it in the book, and I, is, I, I remember this vividly talking to senior White House and Treasury officials between February 26th and 27th, uh, February 22nd and 26th, when the first invasion happened on the 26th, second, and the and, um, sanctions hit on the 26th, between that period, it was largely thought that this invasion is a 72 hour op operation, Kiev will fall. Um, so it didn't fall right away. It still is there. That's one piece. But the other side of it is that without violating sanctions, Russia has bought a billion dollars worth of American and European microchips for their war technology. Mm -hmm. And that's wild. So the war is still going because they can still do business. Because if we sanction everything, we completely cut them off. The pain is too much for us. Because if you remember February the first two, you know, half of 2022, our, our gas prices went up in the U.S. Gasoline costs went up because of the sanctions. And so we all have, face a bit of economic pain to protect this tiny democracy that not everyone necessarily could immediately find on a map in America. Um and so it's really hard to make that judgment, uh, which, and it's one of those things where you kind of think, well, if you're explaining, you're losing the argument, which is mm -hmm. one thing I do say to administration officials sometimes. Um, but it, it's not an easy question to answer. Um, if you're China, you know, from what I've heard, it's part of their calculus that it will be painful. It will, but they can factor it into their planning now, right? Because they've seen how far the U.S. is willing to go. Yeah, I really like your distinction between strategy and tool. And it seems like when you're looking at the war in Ukraine, clearly a huge part of the strategic failure was the inability to deter a Russian invasion 2014 to 2021. That was the clear policy. Crimea was a surprise. They could go further. So let's do what we can to deter an actual invasion. That was a failed part of the policy. Maybe um, an awareness of that sanctions nuclear option being on the table um, 
could have served as a possible deterrent to an invasion. Um, and then that being on the table in the case of China could serve as a possible deterrent um, when it comes to Taiwan or other parts of the Indo-Pacific. But the key thing is that's a hammer, not the overall um, thing you're working with. So, okay, here's the last big question then. And this is where we get into the like, there's a lot of like Twitter discourse about this and there's a lot of marketing, a lot of hype. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. This started as a, you know, Goldman Sachs term um, in the 2000s, but quickly kind of turned into like, a quasi real thing, but also kind of like an internet meme. There's lots of talks about how like the BRICS are dissatisfied with the fact that the US is so dominant um, in the world order today. Um, and we're living in a more multipolar world. And obviously one of the ways by which the US maintains the status quo is the strength of the dollar and the use of the reserve currency. Um, after the Russia sanctions policy, there was a lot of talk about the BRICS coming together to create an alternative, uh, an alternative system. Talk about like just fact check all of this discourse um, of what's actually happening because you could have all sorts of meetings in South Africa. That's not the same thing as actually putting together a serious plan. And it's not quite clear whether Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa actually do have perfectly aligned monetary and fiscal interests. So yeah, just close by giving us a, a real understanding of what this like quasi alternative system is and could look like. Well, first of all, it's really happening, right? There are these meetings, there are actions being taken of companies saying, let's not necessarily settle our contracts and account, whether I if I sell like a, the world's biggest wood pulp producer and oil is now being settled in contracts that are outside the dollar, just through bilateral trade. It's actually happening. Um, it's not happening to the extent that the headlines and the rhetoric from these countries might suggest because it's very hard to move away from the dollar. Russia still needs dollars. They can buy as much material and goods in Indian rupees. The fact of the matter is they can't, no one wants to take those rupees off their hand. They can't use it to purchase other things the way they can the dollar. Um, the other component I will flag is that the, the dollar remains a safe haven asset. So when things get sticky, you have a global financial crisis, you have a, a global pandemic, um, when people are looking for a safe haven, they come to the dollar or the U.S. treasuries or investments in the U.S. because they know it's a stable democracy. Um, but this is happening. It's I think the U.S. needs to pay attention to it. It is paying attention to it. It has mm -hmm. put U.S. economic policy makers in a defensive posture. You'll hear Janet Yellen. Uh, you'll hear Fed officials, uh, Fed a Fed governor, Christopher Waller, just in February gave a speech dedicated to the dollar, which is ra a rare topic for a Fed official to talk about. They always say, well, the U.S. currency policy is the purview of the Treasury Department. It's almost like we're getting to that I'm not a crook moment of like, <laughs> there's nothing to see here. That means there is something. You're thinking about it. You're discussing it. You spent several hours writing a a, a, a speech and your, what your comments are going to be. Um, so I would say it is worrying officials and but it's not happening to the extent that maybe the headlines suggest it should be paid attention to. But I will actually point everyone like a U.S. audience inward, right? So no matter what happens overseas, there's nothing wrong with U.S. power, a dollar um, dominance plateauing a little bit, coming down just a little bit, and then just settling there. It doesn't have to be as dominant as it is now to still remain potent and provide all of the things that it has provided the world and the country itself. Um, those countries are not, you know, a lot of the countries that are moving away from the dollar, they are not uh, democracies like ours. So we have rule of law, free and fair elections, um, independent agencies, so hopefully in 10, 15, 20 years, we remain that we have free and fair elections and democratically elected leaders. Whereas in other countries that are part of the BRICS plus block that's moving away from the dollar, if their closed autocracy, if their dictator dies as everyone dies, or if he's moved out of power, then that instability might bring them back to the dollar or lose that focus on moving away from the dollar. But I am again, I'm going to point inward, inward because and I got this, you know, I, my interview with um, George W. Bush's third secretary, Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson was so interesting. And he said, and he said this many times, somehow it resonated when he said it to me when I interviewed him that 
you know, as long as America is strong and our economy is strong, we're fine. So as long as if we can get over the partisanship, if we can maintain our public finances in a mature way, sure, we haven't actually reached the debt ceiling, ceiling, but even if we fight about it constantly and take that deadline to 1159 before it breaches and play chicken, that fight is bad. If we um, can unite behind leaders and uh, stay strong ourselves, have a strong economy ourselves, then it doesn't matter what happens around the world. The dollar, the strength, that strength of the dollar will be able to endure whatever else is coming at it. Very well said. Um, can you just close us out uh, by shouting out your your actual podcast? Um, you've got a, we're obviously we're trying to move a book here, but I think it's also great to throw some downloads some way because yeah. um, you do a bunch of things, obviously. Yeah. So the book is, first, the book is called Paper Soldiers, How the Weaponization of the Dollar Changed the World Order. It is out, out March 19th. Please order it. But I also have a podcast called The Big Take DC. Uh, and some of the topics that we, uh, Marshall, you and I talked about, um, especially Russia sanctions, I talked to the chief economist for sanctions at Treasury about have Russian have Russian sanctions from the U.S. that we've led worked or not worked and why? And let's get into it. I talked, unpack it. We come out every Thursday. We talk about, um, you know, my ethos as a reporter has just been, let's connect what happens in Washington to the rest of the world. And I'm from Ohio, so I'm always going to bring in the like Midwestern perspective of how it affects middle Americans, uh, not just the right and left coasts. So um, definitely have a listen. Uh, it's available on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you find your podcast. Podcasts. Thanks for joining me on The Realignment. This has been really fun. Thank you so much, Marshall.